Come on, we got to get after it. Mark chapter 10, let's go. We've been in this series. It's been amazing, a lot of, a lot of fun, a lot of exciting things, fast moving. I don't have a ton of time today. I do want to say this um, as we're getting going. I know that this, this service is typically pretty crowded. I think we got a few families, last minute vacations. But in the fall, this is going to get a little crazy. We have a little bit more room at our 9 o'clock service. If any of you feeling like you could just muster up a, a couple extra hours in front and get over here, you're going to create some space for some new guests coming in. It's, it's, it's a problem, but it's a good problem. It's an opportunity to reach Homestead. Thank you guys for your help with that. I want to welcome everybody joining us online, especially my brother Lionel Rios, praying for you, bud. Love you. And I was talking to him this week. Many of you know that he took a, a terrible fall, and he's been in uh, banged up for weeks now, and God's really working on him. He's getting better. He shouldn't be here, but God, God protected him, and is here, and he's getting better, and he said, I'm going to try to get in here next week, and I can't wait to see him in here, and it's exciting. We love you, bud. Um, so well, listen, I don't know what your circumstances are. Anybody grateful for your circumstances in life? Okay, just want to make sure that there's some of you out there, because there's a lot of complaints. It's easy to complain. It just is. And I know some of the cir circumstances naturally come. They just come on us. It's something we didn't ask for. Other situations, you, you might have done yourself. You, you dug your own hole, and now you got to pay the consequences for that. Uh, either way, sometimes we feel trapped by life. We feel like we can't get out of it. Maybe that's through finances or life or your health or your career, your family, your relationships. And maybe you feel like, I'm doing everything right. Well, you're not doing everything right. You might be doing a lot of things right, but we trust God. And maybe you still feel like you're punishing, being punished by God. And God doesn't work that way. He, he loves us so much that he demonstrated his love for us. And while we were still sinners, he died for us. So that's not it either. However... However, sometimes we have to go through these difficult things in life. Jesus was always teaching his disciples, and there's, you know, things that change sometimes as we petition God and we ask him for his help, and God, would you change this situation? And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't, but they always have a purpose, and I think the cross is proof of that. Remember when Jesus was in the garden, and he said, if this cup can pass from me or you can remove this cup from me, and, and God said, that's not, that's not going to happen to his son. And he went to the cross and he died. But it was a purpose. It was a horrific thing that he had to go through. But it was for the joy set before him, which is you and your salvation, right? And I know it's challenging at times. But there's something that I believe in you, just like I told these kids. Same for you. I believe that, one, God loves you. And two, that he has an extraordinary plan for your life. And he is not finished with you. No matter where you're at today, no matter what you're feeling, you feel left out, he's not done. You feel trapped, he's not done. You feel stuck, he's not done. God's not through with you. You're not too young, you're not too old, you're not too decrepit, you're not too sinful to be used. God will clean you up and use you for his glory, but you got to allow him to do it. And sometimes you got to get past yourself, which is really hard. Last week he said in verse 31, he said, for many who are first will be last and the last first. And he was beginning to show us again how the kingdom works. It looks opposite of what we think. It's counterintuitive to what the world says. We're going to jump in three different portions of this and try to finish up chapter 10 today. So hang up, hang on tight. Verse 32 and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, as would have been custom. And they were amazed, and those who followed him were afraid. And taking the twelve, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him. So again, this is the third time Jesus begins to reveal what's about to happen in his life. Jesus was on mission. From a very young age, he understood that, right? They, they left him at the temple, and they said, what are you doing, Jesus? You should have stayed with him. He said, don't you know I must be about my father's business and the father's business was to go to the cross and pay the ultimate price for your freedom and my freedom and everybody who chooses to accept it so this determination that he had to not just talk about it but actually walk towards this hyper hyper tense political environment he's not he's not running from it he's walking towards jerusalem most of us are like, oh, there's a bad spot up there. I'm going this way, right? No, he's walking towards it, and I think that's where their amazement came from. It's like, wow, you're telling us that you're going to have all these problems with all these people, and all this bad stuff is going to happen, as we'll see in a minute, and you're walking right into the storm. Verse 33 says, saying, see, 
We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him. They will spit on him. They will flog him. They will kill him, and after three days, he will rise. That's a lot that's going to happen, and he's marching right towards it. Not being deterred at all by, by fear or dismay. He's marching towards them knowing this has to be it. This is what has to happen. But there's something on the back end of that. Verse 34. And after three days, he will rise. So a lot's going to happen in a short amount of time. And when he tells us that after three days he rise, what he's saying is, I'm promising you this. It's a promise of redemption. And it's a promise of resurrection. It's a promise of hope for those who will put their hope in him. It's a hope for a future. Things can be different because I am going to do this. Now, he kind of pauses there for a second. And we jump on to verse 35, and Mark makes a little bit of a shift here. And he says, and James and John, you know, James and John are pretty excited guys. James and John, the son of Debbie, uh, Zebedee, the, they're sons of thunder. They get excited about things, like, kind of like Simon Peter. It says they came up to him, and they said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. <laughs> That's such a human way, isn't it? We're just going to slide over and try to get, you know, you know, go around the side. It's about relate. It's who you know. It's not what you know. You know what I mean? And so they would try to get a sideways conversation with Jesus. And of course, of course, they said, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. And Jesus knows. He knows the motive behind this. And he says to them, what do you want me to do for you? Now, or sometimes people come here and we have conversations, and I'll tell you this, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a licensed counselor. I sit with people. I pray with them. My wife and I do that. We pray. We steer you towards Scripture. But I'm not a counselor. I don't, that's, that's not my profession. I'm a pastor. I do some counseling, but it's not my job. But sometimes I'll ask people, because they get themselves in a jam, and I'll ask them a couple of things. One thing is, what are the top three things that you would eliminate, your top three pr problems in your life right now? Can you identify those? And then I'll jump to the opposite side of that and say, what are the three things that you think you should add in your life right now? Now, most, most people will hem haul around, and they'll say some things, but I'll tell them, I don't even want you to answer the question right now. I want you to be able to identify those things that are problematic in your life and say if I could I would eliminate those now some of those need to be prayed about because sometimes they think it's it's their loved ones <laughs> and I'm like no you don't need to eliminate your loved ones that's not what needs to happen you might have some tension with them right now but that's what not what needs to happen and so we look at this and we say he, he's saying what do you want he already knows the motive behind this and verse 37 says they they told him we want you to grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. They wanted the clout. That's all they wanted, which is what most people want. They want to get to the top, be in control, be the boss, call the shots, however you want to lay it out. And they didn't know what they were asking for. And Jesus tells them exactly that in verse 38. He says to them, you do not know what you are asking are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Now, the cup is represented. The cup can be positive or negative. I just mentioned to you the fact that in, in the Gospels when Jesus is in the garden and he's praying, he said, can this cup pass for me or can this cup be removed from me? And it couldn't. That was a cup of suffering. This is what Jesus is talking about. It's a cup of suffering. You don't know what you're asking for. Anybody ever been promoted to a salary position from an hourly position? It's got some positives. It also has some negatives, doesn't it? Because when they would hold you over back in the day, what would they pay you if you went past 40 hours? Ah, overtime. How many of you like overtime? I mean, I don't like the hours. I just like the pay. You know what I mean? Um, but what we know is that when you go on salary and you realize... They're going to hold you to the work is done. You just don't get anything extra for it. <laughs> you got a little bit of position. You feel good about it for about 10 minutes. Then you show up and you go like, oh, 
whoa, I see what's going on here, right? And you can't really change it at that moment. You want to, I want to go back to Alley. No, you're locked in at this. See, what, it's very similar to what Jesus is saying. You guys don't know. You want to get here, but you don't know what comes with it. You don't know. He's trying to explain to them everything that is going to happen. I just told you guys what would happen, right? And this baptism expression is kind of a parallel idea here that, you know, in the Old Testament, this picture of this, this overwhelming calamities that come over us, it's a challenge. And, and here in the New Testament, Jesus is saying, these are the challenges that I'm going to face. And guess what? They still thought they were in it to win it. Verse 39 says, and they said to him, we are able are you sure? Are you sure? Because you're going you're, you're gonna to get something. And you're going to get what you want. You're just probably not going to want what you get in the long run. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you'll drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. It's prophetic. James and John, who he's talking to here, James would be the first martyr uh, outside of Stephen. Stephen was the first martyr, but the, of the twelve, James would be the first one to die. John would go through horrific torture, although not be killed by the hands of man. He would die and be be marooned on the Isle, Isle of Patmos, where he get the revelation from God. But nevertheless, he was boiled in oil and some horrific things that had happened to him. So Jesus was telling them, well, you, like, you, you think you can take the cup? You think you can take the suffering? Because you're going to get it. You're going to get it. But there's something inside of that too. 40 says, but to sit at my right hand or my left, it's not me to grant. This is what Jesus said. I don't make that decision, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. So there's 12 disciples. James and John pull Jesus to the side. They get the conversation with him. When the 10 find out what James and John did, they're super mad about it. You know why? Because James and John got there first. <laughs> they wanted the same thing. This is what humanity does. I want to get it. I can't. James and John, I can't believe you got there before me. I can't believe you got there. So they were mad about it. And what we begin to see Jesus talk about in just a minute is this, not just this idea of, of just people or personalities or leaders or this or that. And what he's talking about is the idea of, of serving or ruling. Most everybody wants to rule. And he says in verse 42, Jesus called them and he said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servants and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. We unpack this in a, in a series on a connect group called Leading Like Jesus by Ken Blanchard. We unpack this. This was the, the, the fundamental scripture that we built off in this whole thing. And this is people. It's just people. This was Jesus saying. It's just people. People want to lord. They want to rule. They want to control. I, I hate those ideas because it breaks us. But if I'm honest, there's times when I want to do that. When I want to, I want to, I want to call the shots until it gets harder, right? Then I'm like, can I get out of this position? No. And there's grace for those moments. If you will do it correctly, when God promotes you, and he's the one that promotes you, you can try to claw your way in there, but you're going to get yourself in trouble. When God promotes you, he didn't say it would be easy. He said, I would be with you. And so as you're promoted, there's, there's a learning curve. It's okay. It's okay if you don't have all the answers in the new position, but you got to stay humble and you got to stay teachable and you got to stay ready and you got to stay on your knees. And I think there's something about capacity or a lack of capacity is a better way to say it that actually should drive you to your knees and say, I don't have it. It'll keep you humble when you don't have all the answers like, God, you're going to have to help with this because I, I just don't know what to do in this situation. And he goes on to say, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mm. This is intense. I was reading about this word ransom. You see it on Matthew uh, chapter 20 as well. But one of the terms that came in quotations with this was this idea or, or this label, this sentence that says, it's the price of release. 
the price of release. Like some, something has to be paid in order for you to walk out of your situation. You don't have it. You don't have what it takes to get yourself out of the situation. But you, you, hopefully you've got two hands that you can open up and say, my God, I don't have what it takes, but I know you do. And, and I know that you said in your scripture that this is a ransom for many. And all we have to do is receive it to walk out in our freedom. And we get, to, we get the release. We get, to, we get to because the price of the release or the cost of freedom has been taken care of by you, Jesus. That's incredible. That's incredible when we begin to think about that and look, look at that. And, and, and so we get introduced again to this, this idea, which is, is a strong word, but the, the theology of substitution. Substitution that Jesus did it for me. This is one of the first phrases that I learned when I was trying to preach in Chinese. Yeah, yes, he, yes, who, T woman, Salah, right? In exchange for, in a substituted way, he stepped in. And paid the cost for my freedom. He's saying it right here. And we look at this. And, and, and this is prophetic again. That he's, he's trying to say this. That I'm going to give my life for many. And everybody who would, who would accept it. Many. Basically. It's for all who accept it. We didn't go like I'm going to pick you. and let me, I get to pick the many. No he said. Anybody who wants to can, uh, seek and save the lost. Who wants it? And so we're asking the same question. Just. We've we got to really get down to the core of what we really need in our life, not what we want, because we, we like to answer with what we want. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Well, can you, give me, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? I'm like, I mean, you just need more of Jesus in your life. Mark makes another quick shift here. This is a story, if you've been around church at all, you've come across. It's the story of blind Bartimaeus. And as we'll see in just a minute, Bar is like this this thing that goes before Timaeus. And Timaeus was his dad, and Bar would have been the son of Timaeus, right? As we see this guy, they're still on their journey. Verse 46 says, and they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. Sitting by the roadside would have been what he could have done. But he wasn't just sitting there. My guess is he's asking for money. Hey, can you, I don't have any, I don't have any eyes. I can't see. I can't really contribute to society. Can you, can you help in any way? Is there anything that you can give that would help us? Right? Anything. Just a couple of alms in his family probably would have been grateful for whatever he could have brought that day. When you're disabled in one way, not, I'm not just talking about physically, I'm talking about spiritually or mentally, however, financially, if you do it well, it'll heighten your other senses. Like, I might not have this, but I got this, right? And everybody has their different giftings. 47 says, when he heard... When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, I wonder, I was thinking about blind Bartimaeus and his life and the situation that he was in and the context that he was in. There weren't probably eye doctors and go to the doctors and see what they say and, hey, we're going to do a cornea transplant or we're going to go this or remove your cataracts or whatever it was. And we love trying to fix things in humanity, don't we? You know, people love remedies. Some of you out there, some of you have given me some remedies before. My favorite story about remedies, though, is um, when Janet and I first got married, we were in China, and I was playing a student faculty basketball game with like, two, there's like 2,000, 2,500 people watching this game, and I rolled my ankle so bad. I'm talking about, you heard that thing like pop, 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 pop. You know what that means? That's all, all the ligaments pulling away from the bones, right? And I've, I've done that enough to know that, hey, it's really hard to break your ankle this way. This way, very easy. But this way, it's like they're not going to do much for you, right? So I just, you know, I try to tough it out because there's like 2,500 people watching. So I was like, oh, I'm cool. But inside, I'm like sweating bullets. <laughs> and so I tighten up my shoe and we walk all the way to our apartment. We're just newlyweds. And we get there and... She's like, I got a plan. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> so she's like, I'm going to run to the market. I'm like, what are you going to the market for? And all they got is vegetables. 
And she comes back with this guy, a guy. I've never seen this guy in my life. But he's, gr- he's got a, a brown paper bag. And he's like, I need a bowl. I'm like, what do you need a bowl for, bro? I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, get your leg, elevate your leg. And he's, he put your, put your leg, I want to look at it. He takes out the bowl and he pulls out a giant bottle of whiskey. And I was like, I don't drink, man. <laughs> like, I, they, you know, I don't even want that in my, he's like, just relax, relax, relax. I got a plan. Everybody's got a plan. They got a remedy. And he pours all this whiskey inside of the bowl. He takes his lighter, he lights it on fire. And he takes my foot and he puts his hand and now his hand's on fire. Literally, I got pictures of it somewhere. You can barely see the flames. But, and he starts just serving. Ah, in my foot. I don't know if you know, they're like, that was painful, like torture. And he's like 15, 20 minutes just digging into my foot. I'm sweating, telling him, what are, what are you doing to me? Right here in the middle of China, I don't know what is going on in my life. I don't, what am I doing here? He says, tomorrow you're going to be perfect. How many of you know that I was not perfect the next day? <laughs> All he did, and when you have trauma inside of your body, it's bleeding inside, right? So that's, what, that's why they turn different colors when you sprain your ankle. It's the blood. It's going. All he did was push the blood everywhere. So the whole bottom of my foot was purple the next day. I hobble over. I got to teach all these thousands of kids English. <laughs> and uh, get over there, walk in there. And my, my PE teacher friend, he's like, no, he didn't do it right. I got a remedy. And, uh, I'm going to bore you with that story. But I, th- I don't think... Bartimaeus was looking for a remedy that day. Some of you have been trying to get a remedy for your, your brokenness. I've been trying to feel the, like the, 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 the pain or the, the injuries. I'm not talking about your physical, some physical, some mental. You've been trying to remedy it with, with some things that don't belong there. He began to shout. And I love this because it, it, gets, it gets past himself. Because a lot of times when you're handcuffed into the situation, you're cemented, you feel trapped, you feel stuck, you know what you do? You start putting what you feel like the limitations are in your situation, you begin to project them onto God. Let me tell you something, God doesn't have any limitations. We are limited, right? But his strength is made perfect in what? My weakness. Not in your strength. Someone like, look how, look how strong I am. And we're singing the singers again. I am weak. He is strong, right? This is like a, a children's church song, but we got we to gotta stop thinking in, in these ideas of that he's limited and start thinking in, in terms of like what is possible if God gets involved. What is possible that if I fully trust him, if I fully believe that things can absolutely fundamentally change in my life, spiritually, physically, mentally, financially, whatever, you fill in the blank with your problems, right? Because all we see in scripture is God coming through. Every time. David walks out in front of Goliath, stands before a giant. The whole army is paralyzed by this guy mocking him. And this little boy comes out and is like, what are you guys doing? (laughs) Where are you guys? You're going to let this guy talk about the God of Israel? And so what I see is is a, a young boy who actually believed God was who he said he was. Apparently nobody else really believed that. That's why they let Goliath stand there and make a fool of him. David's like, no, I believe it. That's why I'm going to throw a rock and knock your block off, buddy. Walls of Jericho come crashing down. The, the Israelites backed up on their way to freedom, backed up to the Red Sea. It doesn't make any sense. Pharaoh's coming down with his chariots, is coming in. God said, I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm not done. Our limitations, what we see that our limitations in our lives are not in God's life, and they provide an opportunity for God to just do something crazy, isn't it? It's just crazy. He's crying out, Son of David, save me. He, didn't, he don't care. I don't care what you guys think about me. Verse 48 says, and many rebuked him, telling him to be quiet. Bartimaeus, shut up. You're bothering everybody. It says he cried out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, son of David. Louder even. You know there's always naysayers around. People love, people love to be like, ah, that ain't it, that ain't it. It says, and Jesus stopped, got his attention. I don't think 
it was just his voice. I think it, the voice was more about Bartimaeus in the crowd than it was about Jesus hearing it. I think he heard it. He was there. Jesus saw something in him, and, and I think Jesus did hear, but what, what he heard was the cry of a heart who was desperate for a touch from him. That's what he heard. It wasn't just, I heard this voice that was annoying me, so I, so I stopped. No, he, he heard something inside of that voice, and it was faith. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called to the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. So isn't it funny how when Jesus gets involved, he, bar, bar, Bartimaeus, shut up. Jesus is like, tell him to come get me. Get up, get excited, bro, he's got you. That's how fickle people are. They change so quickly, don't they? Remember, if we're not careful, we forget the fact that Jesus is on mission. He's, he's marching towards Jerusalem, right, through Jericho. He's on his way. He's going, he's telling them all the way, hey, they're going to kill me. They're going to beat me. They're going to flog me. They're going to they're gonna hand me over. They're going to condemn me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to crucify me. Hold on one second. There's somebody in need. He wasn't too busy that he couldn't stop. Verse 50 says, and throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. What does your coming to Jesus look like? If you've been in church, your old school church, remember the, the term they would say, we had a come to Jesus moment? <laughs> you know what that means? Most of the time it means you were like this. You didn't have anywhere else to go. I'm talking about low, low. So low you got to look up to see bottom low. Right? That kind of low is like, we had a come to Jesus moment. Sometimes your dad will tell you you got to come, come to Jesus moment too. That, he was about to send you to Jesus. That's what that meant. Stand with me real quick. I got to finish this in a couple minutes. Hang on tight. And Jesus said to him, it's the same question that he asked James and John. Different scenarios. Different heart. Different heart. James and John, you don't even know what you're asking for. You can't. You, you're going to get this cup. It's coming. Don't worry. But you don't even know what you're asking for. He asked blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. He had something in his heart that caused him to believe in some way, at some level, that God could fix his situation. If you're in here, you got this much faith. Good. Let it grow. You got this much faith? Let it grow. You got the faith to move the mountain? Let it grow. Some of you just have a gift of faith. The Bible says that. Some people just have it. They just have a gift of faith. Like, I don't know. It's going to be okay. Others of you worrying down the, worrying the paint off the walls, talking about it all the time. I don't know why it's like that. People just, just like that sometimes. But one of the signs of a person who's maturing in their faith, in their path of discipleship, is that they believe more than they used to. <laughs> I believe, but help my unbelief. Verse 52, Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. What a change. Can you imagine for a moment that you were trapped in a situation and you cried out to God and people laughed at you and they said, would you just be quiet? You're a crazy person. And you cried out all the more. You just got louder and you got more persistent and you just stayed the course and you just believed and you said, I believe, but help my unbelief and your faith begin to grow. And then God just healed the situation. should be able to imagine it because if you're in this room and you have him as your Lord and Savior that's exactly what he did it's exactly what he did <laughs> some of you feel stuck today you feel trapped handcuffed to your stuff there's probably a bunch of you whatever your situation is God is here to help I'm not saying everything will be perfect in your life. I'm saying he will be with you. 
Isaiah 41 10 do not fear for I am with you do not look anxiously look about you for I am your God I will strengthen you surely I will help you surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand so going all the way full circle now there's a couple things I believe about you one God loves you two he has an amazing plan for your life and three he is not finished do you have the faith to cry out to him today do you have the faith to cry out to him today let's bow our heads together thank you for loving us so much Lord all of us have been in a situation where we have struggled some of us did that to ourselves but not everybody some of us have taken a physical illness or something that's come upon us that we didn't ask for, we didn't run into, it just came to us. Regardless of our situation, we are here, we are paused right here to seek you and your kingdom first. Listen, nobody's looking around. If you have been or you feel trapped or stuck right in this moment, would you just lift up your hand? It's a sign of you crying out to God saying, I need help, son of David. God sees you all the way from heaven. You can put your hands down. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the, the cost that was paid on Calvary for freedom, the release of the debt of sin. We believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouth that you are Lord and Savior. And we thank you for it. Thank you for saving us, Jesus. Be the Lord of our lives. Lord, I know there's a lot of needs in this room right now from physical to mental, spiritual, relational, all kinds of needs, God. And we're crying out to you. You're the only one. You're the only one, Lord. We look to the hill where our help comes from. We look to you, Lord. We ask, Holy Spirit, for a special dispensation of grace and mercy and peace and truth and hope and life and that we will have the strength to put one foot in front of the other for this next season. And no matter what happens, God, we're going to give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. And we're going to keep crying out no matter what happens. We ask that you alone, God, would change our situation and that we would recognize and thank you all the way to eternity. We love you. We love you. We love you. We thank you. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. Have your way in our lives. We pray all of this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Can we put our hands together, church? All right, a couple things real quick. I hope you guys have an amazing week. We love you guys. If nobody told you that, we're excited about it and can't wait to see you next week. If you can make some room by shifting to the nine, we sure would appreciate it. We always pray our benediction. Let's pray it together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. See you guys soon. Grace and peace.